So we're going to talk about inflammatory CNS diseases tonight. Um, and pretty much by talking about that, it's going to be, these are non-infectious inflammatory CNS diseases. That's the most common thing that um, you're going to see. So I really like um, diagnosing these diseases and, and also um, the treatments. I think they can be really interesting cases and, and can be rewarding. I mean, as we'll go through, you'll see the prognoses for some of these isn't so great, but, um, but I think just knowing more about them, you can educate your clients and just be aware of these cases. When we say infectious inflammatory, we say that because oftentimes they have very similar presentations and you can't tell just by looking at them is this infectious or inflammatory, but you should start thinking along those lines. Um, so as I said earlier, infectious is much less common than more of a autoimmune or immune mediated in inflammatory diseases. Um, so just to go over some terms, um, when we're talking about inflammation of the nervous system, we can either be talking about the meninges, which is meningitis of the brain, encephalitis, myelitis would mean the spinal cord, or we can see a combination of, of any of these together. Um, as far as the infectious things that we can see, um, we can see viruses like distemper, um, FIP in cats, protozoa like toxoplasma, neospora, fungal organisms, tick-borne diseases, parasites, and rarely do we see bacteria as a cause of inflammatory CNS disease in dogs. Non so again, non-infectious inflammatory disease is much more common. The main defense that the nervous system has against any of these um, diseases is the blood-brain barrier, which consists of three things. So we have the, the tight junctions between the endothelial cells, um, we have a non-fenestrated basement membrane, and then we have the astrocytes in the CNS. So this is how the brain protects itself, and which is good. The bad thing is it also is going to be relevant when it comes to treating these diseases. You have to be able to get past the blood-brain barrier in order to, to successfully treat these things, which we'll talk about when we go over some of the medications. Most inflammatory diseases are going to have a pretty acute onset, and they're going to be progressive. Some of them can have a little bit more of a chronic course, but typically it's going to be pretty fast in progression. Um, so other things that are going to be acute in onset like that would be trauma or vascular events, but both of those should be non-progressive. Um, most of the time neoplasia is going to have a little bit more of an insidious onset, um, but it can also be very similar to infectious and inflammatory diseases. Some of the other differentials that um, can present very similar would be degenerative type diseases, anomalous things like hydrocephalus in young dogs, metabolic diseases um, like hepatic encephalopathy. Of course, there's going to be a lot of overlap between neoplastic things. Um, we can see a lot of idiopathic syndromes that sometimes you have a hard time distinguishing between um, central lesions, of course, toxins, trauma. When we're talking about specifically intracranial things, we tend to break it down to forebrain versus brainstem. So when we're talking about the forebrain, we're talking about the cerebrum and the thalamus. When we're talking about the brainstem, we're talking about the midbrain, the pons and the medulla, and the cerebellum. So we kind of group those things together because typically dogs with a forebrain lesion have very distinct signs from those with a brainstem lesion. And this chart kind of highlights some of those differences. So the, the, the hallmark of, that, of a dog with a forebrain lesion is kind of like that video that we saw. It's a dog that, for the most part, has a fairly normal gait. They're not going to have a significant paresis or ataxia, um, but they may be circling. They may have an abnormal mentation. They may be head pressing. Um, but for the most part, if you see an animal that's significantly paretic, whether it's hemiparetic or quadruparetic, usually that indicates a brainstem lesion. Um, other things that tell you that it's forebrain are things like seizures. Um, typically, visual deficits are going to be more referable to a forebrain lesion. Um, and then cranial nerves, other than one and two, all of your cranial nerves come from the brainstem. So if you see an animal with cranial nerve deficits, then you know you're dealing with brainstem. So if you're seeing signs like seizures, plus you're seeing a head tilt, or you're having an animal that's having seizures and they're significantly paretic, you should start thinking this animal has multifocal disease. And that's one of the hallmarks of infectious or inflammatory diseases.
So the presenting signs for dogs with inflammatory disease um, are pretty variable. The, a lot of the inflammatory diseases that affect the brain um, like to affect the, the brain stem. So you will see, that's where you're gonna see your cranial nerve deficits. Um, altered mentation, you can see with both a forebrain or a brain stem lesion. Paresis, again, like I said, that's going, mainly gonna be seen with a brain stem lesion. Seizures, if you've got forebrain involvement proprioceptive deficits. Neck pain is, is I'd say, also fairly common in these dogs um, with intracranial lesions, and that either can indicate that they have involvement of their cervical spine as well, or sometimes we'll see neck pain just secondary to intracranial lesions from increased intracranial pressure. So with most other diseases, one of the first things you're gonna wanna do when these dogs come in is a minimum database, just trying to rule out anything systemic. Um, most of the time, if we're dealing with uh, one of these non-infectious non inflammatory diseases, everything's gonna be pretty unremarkable. But again, you wanna rule out the mimics, um, looking for you know, a young dog, does this dog have a liver shunt? Are we dealing with potentially some electrical abnormalities, hypoglycemia, something else that could cause these signs? Um, and so again, bile acids, thyroid testing, that's gonna depend on probably your minimum database and your suspicion for those diseases. But oftentimes, if the minimum database is normal, there's a strong suspicion of a CNS inflammatory disease. We're going to be moving on to things like MRI or CT and CSF taps. So CSF is very important when it comes to diagnosing these diseases. And for some of them that will go over, that's all you need to get a diagnosis. But most of the time, it helps in conjunction with the imaging. CSF is very sensitive when it comes to diagnosing inflammatory disease, but it's not very specific. So we can see a wide range of findings and it doesn't necessarily, with some diseases, tell us um, specifically this is an autoimmune inflammatory disease versus an infection. But there are some where it's a little bit more specific that we'll go over. Um, as far as just to know normals, normal CSF usually has almost zero white blood cells. The acceptable number is, is less than five. <clears throat> Protein is also pretty low. Um, 25 when you're doing a AO tap and in the lumbar, you can have a little bit of a higher protein level and that can be normal. When we're dealing with inflammatory diseases, since most of the time they're affecting the brain or the cervical cord, you're gonna be doing a tap from the cisterna magna. So that's right between the skull and C1. And we do see some inflammatory diseases that affect more of the thoracolumbar spinal cord. So in that case, you'd wanna do a lumbar tap, but I'd say it's pretty rare that you're doing that to diagnose an inflammatory disease. When it comes to analyzing CSF, one of the, the biggest problems is just that it needs, to be, um, it needs to be processed immediately because the protein level is so low, the white blood cells will start to deteriorate really fast. So it should be analyzed within an hour, which used to be a concern before we had IDEX here, because we couldn't do it. So you'd have to do some sort of preservation, whether it's add serum, you could add formalin or head of starch, but if you do those things, it's gonna affect some of the other values. So it's not ideal, but um, now that we have IDEX here, you can run your sample over here. What they do is they, went, they go ahead and they do the cell counts on it immediately. They do a protein here they spin it down and they make the slides, which then go to the pathologist. So you don't have final results immediately, but they at least process it and that's the most important part. As far as doing a CSF collection, you don't need any real special equipment. The only thing that a lot of people may not have on hand is the spinal needles. When it comes to doing a, um, a small dog, less than 10 pounds or cats, I actually just use a regular 22 gauge needle I don't even use a spinal needle. And you just collect it. Typically, if it's not a lot of blood contamination, you can just collect it into a sterile red top tube. If there is blood, then usually you're gonna put it into a purple top so it doesn't clot. The landmarks for doing a CSF collection are gonna be your occipital protuberance. On the back of the skull is gonna identify, basically that's identifying midline and also showing kind of the, the cranial border of where you're gonna go and feeling the wings of the atlas and that kind of forms a triangle and you basically go right in the middle. As far as doing a, um, a lumbar tap, that's done typically between L4-5 or L5-6 is where you're gonna go. And say so as far as doing a, a, a tap, 
Um, when it comes to doing an AO tap, there is certainly the potential for complications, and there are some cases which will go over where it's contraindicated to do a CSF tap, but um, as far as doing a lumbar tap, there's less risk of complications, but it is, I'd say, more difficult, and there's more risk of blood contamination, and in a small dog or cat, you're not gonna be able to get enough fluid there, but if it's something that you're interested in learning how to do, and you don't feel comfortable with starting with an AO tap, you can start with a lumbar tap, because you can't really cause a lot of harm trying a lumbar tap. But this is just a, a short video. Um, how many people out there do CSF taps or have done a CSF tap? You don't count. <laughs> so there's, there's definitely cases where I think it's, um, you know, there, there's cases where, like I said, we can get a, a diagnosis with a tap and make sure that we're treating the animal appropriately and, and they don't have to come in and get an MRI. Um, and some of those cases we're, we're going to talk about with, you know, dogs that have young dogs with steroid responsive meningitis. But I think, you know, people are pretty nervous when it comes to doing spinal taps. And um, I'm going to say it's really just a matter of, you know, just, just go for it. You know, you can practice on recently deceased animals if, you know, the owner's okay with that. You can still get CSF from a, an animal that's been euthanized just like you, you normally could. But basically, the, if you're doing an AO tap, you're going to clip the, the back of the head. And if you're right-handed, it's much easier to do it with the animal in right lateral recumbency. So they do have to be under general anesthesia. So it involves at least two people, sometimes three, depending on how the animal's doing. But if they're doing well under anesthesia, then you can do it with two people, because whoever's running anesthesia can also be your holder. But you're going to have the animal in right lateral recumbency. And you're going to feel, typically palpate with your left hand and advance the needle with your right hand if you're right-handed. So obviously if you're left-handed then you do it the opposite but you feel the occipital protuberance and again that tells you basically the the caudal aspect of the skull and the wings of the atlas and then you go in the middle and usually I'll use a styletted needle if it's a dog bigger than 10 pounds a, a one and a half inch spinal needle is, is adequate for most dogs except for huge dogs you may need a two and a half inch but for small dogs up to a hundred pound dog you should be able to get it with a one and a half inch needle and typically you'd advance and in a dog you're usually going to feel anywhere from one to three pops as you go through the different fascial planes and in the beginning when you're you know feel you're not sure exactly where you are typically I'll pull out the stylet every time I feel a pop and just see if fluid comes and it should come pretty quickly and very easily. So if it's not coming, you just advance another millimeter or so. Um, but, and then eventually the fluid comes. And it should come out again pretty easily. You never want to actually attach the syringe to the needle and aspirate it. You want to let it come out on its own. And you either can collect it directly into a syringe and then put it into a tube, or just hold the tube under there. Or you can even have a third person if you need to hold the, the tube and collect the fluid. So again, we, now that we have IDEX here, you can get your sample, have a runner come to the lab, and you don't have to worry about doing any of the, the preservation stuff. So, so that's for, for CSF. Um, before we get into specific diseases, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the imaging. So our two choices for looking at the the nervous system is CT or MRI. CT is great when it comes to looking at bone. It's great for looking at things like skull fractures, seeing acute hemorrhage after trauma. Um, if we have significant contrast enhancing lesions like a large forebrain tumor, CT is going to be adequate. It's going to show you what you need. But when it comes to diagnosing most inflammatory diseases, CT is not very good. And when it comes to looking at the brainstem, CT is, is very poor. So if you have an animal that's showing signs compatible with the brainstem, CT is not a good choice for them. And so 
I just kind of wanted to go over a little bit of that so you can help you know prepare your clients if they are coming for imaging this is what your 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 dog needs and this is why and one of the reasons for CT um, doesn't work for the brainstem is you can see up here in the top left this is starting rostral and going back to the brainstem here's the bola and that's another thing CT is great for looking at the bola if you're looking for middle ear disease fluid in there um, it's great but when we get back to the brainstem all these black streaks these white streaks coming through that's all artifacts so when it comes to looking at something back here unless you have a giant tumor that's taken up contrast you're not going to see anything back here in the brain stem um, because the bone is so thick back here even on CT you end up with all this artifact and this is just an example of two cases here again this is a dog that you could potentially mistake this for a lesion this was just all artifacts you can see the streaking and again over here you can see all this streaking so these are cases that have primarily brain stem signs are not going to benefit from a CT they really need an MRI. So here's two dogs side by side at kind of similar places. At the, you can see the bola here, and this is the brain stem. This is the caudal aspect of the cerebrum. Over here, same thing. The white is the ventricles. You can see all the sulci. You can see the difference between white and gray matter. You can see the brain stem. You can see the, this is the mesencephalic aqueduct and the CSF around the brain stem. We still can see the bola. We don't see the skull. The, the bone is always black on MRI, so it's not good for detecting subtle bony changes, but, um, but you could still look for middle ear disease. So if you're worried, you know, does this animal have middle ear disease or is it brain stem? MRI is gonna tell you that. CT can rule out the middle ear disease, but it may miss a brain stem lesion completely. So MRI definitely is preferred for any sort of intracranial imaging. Again, sometimes CT is adequate for very specific cases, but in the majority of the time, MRI is gonna be much more likely to give us our answer than CT. And we are fortunate now that we have MRI here available, so it's typically available most days of the week. The downsides to MRI is it does take a lot longer. The CT, you can do a brain and 10 or so minutes, uh, MRI is gonna be more like an hour. So there are some cases where you don't think the patient's stable enough for anesthesia for MRI, um, or, and also it, it costs more. So it's definitely a more expensive modality, but if, you know, like I said, your animal's showing predominantly brain stem signs, it's really a waste of someone's money to even do a CT most of the time. As far as what we're going to see on MRI um, with inflammatory diseases, it's extremely, extremely variable. So just a, a brief introduction to, to MRI, which is another one of my favorite things. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, just we have the main images we do is going to be T2s or T1s. And the big difference between those is on a T2, we have two things that are always going to be bright, and that's fat and fluid. So you can see the fat up here, thin layer of subcutaneous fat, and the fluid in the ventricles. On T1, the only thing that's typically bright is going to be the fat. Fluid is going to be dark. And so a T1 is what then we give contrast and run a post. So this is a post-contrast image, and this is a dog with an inflammatory lesion. So inflammatory lesions are usually going to be kind of ill-defined. They may be multifocal. Sometimes they'll have a mass effect, um, and typically, again, they're gonna, they're due to increased fluid and inflammation in the brain, so they're gonna be bright on the T2 and they're gonna show up really nice, versus a lot of times on T1, they don't show up unless they enhance. And just to show you some, some different things that we could see on MRI, this is an example of a, a midline meningioma in a dog. So it's, it has pretty well-defined borders it's very uniformly enhancing. That's a classic appearance for a meningioma. This is a pretty classic appearance for a, a glioma. They tend to occur down in this area of the brain. They oftentimes are kind of have this wispy enhancement, but you can see there's definitely some overlap. So we don't always, after an MRI, have a clear cut answer, but I'd say 90% of the time, you're gonna be able to distinguish between a, a tumor and an inflammatory lesion. <coughs> and this is a dog with a pituitary tumor and we'll see some of these dogs sometimes that 
different subject, but I've seen some of these dogs come in with tumors this big. They're you know half the the size of their brain, and their only clinical sign is they're just a little bit off. When I say they're just acting a little different, these dogs oftentimes don't have seizures. They just maybe are a little bit um, have a decreased appetite. They're just a little lethargic, and then we image them and find this giant tumor. And then this is a, a example of a, um, a vascular lesion. So this is a T2 image. So again, fluid is going to be bright. So this is a, a cerebellar infarct in a dog. And what you'll see with vascular lesions is typically they're also going to be bright on T2. And they have very, very defined borders because they're typically involving a specific vessel. So they're going to be confined to the territory of that vessel. The specific diseases we're going to touch on here is going to be steroid responsive meningitis. We're going to talk a little bit about eosinophilic meningoencephalitis, GME, which is one of the more common ones, and the necrotizing encephalitides. And then we're going to talk about what is meningoencephalitis of unknown etiology and corticoid steroid responsive tremor syndrome. So to start with, steroid responsive meningitis arteritis is the most common form of meningitis that you're going to see in dogs. This is typically a disease that's in young dogs, usually under a year, but there is a, a definite range. And I think of this as involving the three Bs, our Beagles, Boxers, and Bernese Mountain Dogs. I've seen it in labs, Weimaraners, so other dogs, but it's most common in young, large breed dogs. Some other names it's been called has been Beagle Pain Syndrome, you might read about it as necrotizing vasculitis, polyarteritis. <coughs> and the most common presenting signs with this is going to be neck pain, plus or minus back pain, because it is more, it is a diffuse disease. These animals, about half of them may have a fever, and they can have some mild proprioceptive deficits, but for the most part, the predominant sign is going to be pain. So these animals aren't going to come in significantly paretic, they're not going to be down. Um, they're usually not going to be having seizures. So you, these are the cases that you can diagnose with a, a CSF tap. And just to revisit this dog quickly. So this is a, again, I think this was a two-year-old beagle. And so this would be a top differential for this dog. Of course, there's other differentials. A beagle, he's also prone to disc disease. That would be high on your suspect list. You can't rule that out without imaging. And also, something like discospondylitis could certainly cause these same signs. So, you know, you can't make the diagnosis just based on symptoms, but a dog comes in looking like this, one of the things you could potentially offer is to do a CSF tap. And if you, if it's normal, you can at least rule this out and say, you know, this is disc disease. So you, you can image these dogs, and sometimes you'll see some meningeal enhancement. This is a post-contrast T1 weighted image, and the meninges here are enhancing. Most of the time, imaging is not done, I'd say, on these dogs. And the diagnosis is made by CSF. What you're going to see is you're going to see an increase in neutrophils. So it's called a neutrophilic pleocytosis when you have an increase in the number of cells. The other main rule out for seeing neutrophils in the spinal fluid is bacterial meningitis, but bacterial meningitis is so rare in dogs that most of the time, if this is what you're seeing, it's going to be a steroid responsive meningitis. If it's a bacterial meningitis, usually there's a systemic infection. There's going to be other signs. We don't typically see a bacterial meningitis in a dog without some sort of systemic infection somewhere significant changes on blood work. Also, the neutrophils would usually be degenerative if it's bacterial. You won't always see organisms, even if it's bacterial, and even sometimes culture in these dogs that have known bacterial meningitis, they can come out negative. So we, we typically don't even culture them, but if I have a breed that seems to fit the syndrome and this is what we're seeing, then we go ahead and we treat them for a steroid responsive meningitis. The prognosis for this is very good. Most dogs can be cured of this if they're treated appropriately. There can be some chronic forms, and these can be dogs that relapsed from the acute form, or some dogs just present with a chronic form. And those do have a more guarded prognosis. 
So a typical protocol for something like this is going to be a long tapering course of steroids. And you do have to start with an immunosuppressive dose. And I typically would taper steroids every three to four weeks. So they're going to be on steroids for several months. If at any point they start to relapse, then that's what I would think about adding in an additional immunosuppressant. But for the most part, these dogs can do well with just PRED as a sole drug. Idiopathic eosinophilic meningitis is a little bit of a newer recognized syndrome, and it's similar to steroid responsive meningitis. Obviously, with the name, what we're seeing is eosinophils in the CSF, so it's never normal to see eosinophils in the CSF. So if you have greater than 10% in the CSF, then it's considered an eosinophilic pleocytosis, and that's diagnostic for, for this disease. This is typically seen also in young dogs, and golden retrievers and rottweilers are the main breeds that this has been reported in. It's been seen more commonly in males, but females can get it as well. I've actually seen, I've only seen this three times, but Two of the times were actually in Italian Greyhounds. The other one was a Golden, so it's a, a little bit, I'm a little biased when I see Italian Greyhounds um, come in the door. The difference between this, obviously, other than the CSF findings and steroid responsive meningitis, these dogs can have more severe clinical signs. So they can present with seizures, circling, cranial nerve deficits. Um, and I've, one of the dogs I saw actually presented with strictly cervical signs. So he didn't have any intracranial signs. He presented like a, a typical dog with a herniated disc in the neck. We did the imaging, didn't see anything, tapped him, and he had a ton of eosinophils in the CSF. So the, the good thing about this disease is it usually has a good prognosis. The differential for seeing eosinophils in the CSF is fungal and protozoal diseases. If that's the case, the prognosis is, is really poor so far. Um, all dogs with infectious forms of eosinophilic meningitis have died, so you hope that it's the, the idiopathic kind, and the treatment is the same as for steroid-responsive meningitis. So this disease, which was kind of called uh, little white shaker disease, or there's some other names for it, but, um, but I think the most common term used now is corticosteroid responsive tremor syndrome. Um, it's seen mainly in small dogs, typically less than five years old and less than 15 kigs. And again, the, the name Little White Shaker is kind of fallen out of favor because about half these dogs are not white. We see them in minpins and Westies and, and other little dogs. And this is one of those diseases that I feel pretty comfortable diagnosing on clinical signs. So not a lot of diseases are gonna cause these kind of fine whole body tremors. They're most of the time present at rest, but they get worse with excitement. And they, they can have some mild deficits on the neuro exam. Sometimes they'll have a menace deficit. Um, sometimes they'll have some mild CP deficits. But for the most part, the rest of their exam is normal, but they have this constant whole body tremor. This is due to a low-grade meningitis. Um, another term for this is cerebellitis. It's thought that this mainly affects the cerebellum. So these dogs, if you do a CSF tap, which I have in some cases, you may see a mild elevation in lymphocytes. But again, this is one of those that there's not a lot of things that's going to cause these sort of symptoms. I've never seen a dog with um, something like steroid responsive meningitis or GME or brain tumor for that matter have these constant tremors like this. Other than I've seen some toxicities do that, but for the most part you usually can rule that out on history. <clears throat> so these dogs are, are treated again with steroids typically a tapering course over a few months, and they seem to do better if you also concurrently treat them with Valium. And the prognosis, again, is, is really good for these guys. You mean oral Valium? Yeah. Injectable just for the... Oral course. Valium. Mm -hmm. Oral Valium three times a day. So granulomatous meningoencephalitis, or GME, 
is a specific inflammatory disease that there is still a lot of unknowns when it comes to this um, syndrome. And this is probably secondary to disc disease and brain tumors, one of the more common things that I see. And I think there's still a lot, like I said, unknown about this and a lot of um, people out there that don't recognize these diseases. And actually, at ACVIM last month, there was a, um, a big panel discussion on, on this disease and with several neurologists around the panel from around the country and there was a neurologist from Europe and um, even just talking about this in a group of neurologists, there was a lot of disagreement in you know, what this disease should be caused, could, should be called, how exactly we should diagnose it, um, what's the best treatment, what actually causes this. So kind of the, right now, the universally accepted um, take home message is this is, I think, some sort of immune mediated disease. There may be a trigger out there, there may be an environmental trigger, there may be an infectious trigger. To date, nothing infectious has been found in these dogs. There's probably some sort of genetic component because we tend to see this in specific breeds of dogs. But overall, it causes some sort of immune mediated reaction. What exactly sets that off, we don't know. But typically by the time these signs are present, whatever that inciting causes is gone. It has a pretty variable onset. The average age of onset is four and a half years, but it can be seen in dogs as young as six months. I think it's the youngest reported. I've never seen it in a dog much younger than a year old. It can be seen in older dogs. So again, it's not super common. It tends to affect, um, again, toy and terrier breeds. Females are a little bit more commonly affected. The caudal fossa, so the brainstem signs, um, are pretty, pretty prominent with this disease. You can see cervical signs. Some dogs, again, can present with just cervical signs and have no intracranial signs. Again, you can see, so it can affect multiple areas of the brain. You can see seizures and, and visual deficits. It's believed to have three forms. Um, distinguishing between these clinically is not a, a huge, I'd say, a, a, a real important point other than the ocular form, but that's not super common, but there is an ocular form that affects the optic nerves bilaterally, and these dogs are gonna present with typically an acute onset and with bilaterally non-responsive dilated pupils. So it can be hard to distinguish something like that from a primary ocular disease, and oftentimes these dogs will go see the ophthalmologist and they will say, we can't find anything, or their ERG is normal, and then they'll come see me and we'll either diagnose it with an MRI or a spinal tap. And some of these dogs will just have the ocular signs. You do an MRI and you see inflammatory lesions all over their brain. So, in, and partly I think it's important for prognosis just to a little bit to know is this primarily ocular or is it more of a disseminated form? Because the ocular dogs seem to do really well. It's variable as far as whether or not they get back their vision, but usually it's not life threatening. But with disseminated or, or focal, these are going to be fatal diseases. So, the diagnosis is really can only be made 100% with histopath, which obviously we're not doing on dogs while they're alive. There are some places that are doing biopsies for these, but as you can imagine, um, that's not gonna be a, a common thing in getting someone to do a, a biopsy of their, their dog's brain and spending you know $1,000 to, to do a biopsy um, when we have a pretty good idea with imaging now and, and CSF what we're dealing with is hard to to get someone to do, and I'm not sure that's the right thing to be doing anyways. I think it's a little bit more academic, but, um, but typically a combination of you know, the appropriate breed, the right age, their clinical prog progression, and imaging and CSF findings is gonna give you a pretty accurate diagnosis. So what you're gonna see on CSF is gonna be an increase in white blood cells, and the degree doesn't necessarily um, 
coincide with the severity of the disease. I see some dogs that have severe changes on MRI or come in with severe clinical signs and they have really mild increases in their white blood cells and other dogs that have a huge increase in white blood cells with only mild clinical signs. These dogs can have a normal CSF, about 10% of them will. So that's where it's important that the imaging and the CSF kind of go together. This is some examples of MRIs of dogs with inflammatory disease that we would pretty much categorize as GME. So the top left, this is a pre-contrast T1. This dog does have dilation of his ventricular system. He's got a little cyst here in front of the cerebellum. And then this is post-contrast, so he's kind of got this patchy enhancement. He's got some increased meningeal enhancement up here as well. And then this is another, this is actually a different dog. Kind of got this patchy enhancement. And again, here's some in the brain stem and up in the forebrain as well. <coughs> this is um, another dog with inflammatory disease. Again, it's a little hard to see probably from far away, but this dog has pretty subtle changes in the brain stem. We'd call the increased white would be hyperintensity. And again, here along the white matter tracks, he's got the same thing a little bit over here and over here. And this is just an example of two different types of MRI sequences we can do that sometimes will help, help highlight some of your inflammatory processes by helping to null the, the CSF fluid. So it helps, this is a inflammation, it helps that stand out. So this is where on a CT, we probably wouldn't see this. But then in combination with a, a spinal tap, we may get an answer. But if that dog was one of the 10% that has a normal CSF, you would do a CT, you do a CSF, and you say, we don't see anything. So MRI is, is definitely much more helpful at, at looking at these. And then this is, again, the, the same, a, or a different dog um, image at the same spot, but just showing different ways that you can do the sequences to help certain lesions stand out against the background. So what exactly is, is going on with GME? Um, it's a disease that typically is concentrated around the blood vessels in the brain. And as far as where these inflammatory cells come from, we don't know if they migrate there or if it's local proliferation of inflammatory cells. Um, but it's considered an angiocentric disease. And what you're going to see on histopath is there's going to be cuffs of monocytes, macrophages, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and these can coalesce to the point where they can form granulomas in the brain, and that's where the, the name comes from. Necrotizing meningoencephalitis is, a, is similar to GME, and, but it's a specific disease. It used to be called pug encephalitis. That was the only breed that initially was thought to, to get this. But it's now been seen in Chihuahuas, Maltese's, and Yorkies. This disease has a little bit younger onset typically, around two and a half years. But again, there's a big age range, and so a lot of overlap between this and GME. And again, there's some overlap between the typical onset of age for dogs with brain tumors. So these dogs sometimes are seven years old, and they come in with these symptoms, specifically a brachycephalic breed like a pug. They come in, they're seven, they're having seizures, and they're circling. Your big differential is going to be something like this, but also a brain tumor has to be on your, your differential list as well. The necrotizing meningoencephalitides tend to be a little bit more rapidly progressing. They um, also, again, are, are fatal, but there is, which we'll talk about, there is treatment that can slow down the disease progression. CSF in these guys typically is going to have a lymphocytic pleocytosis. So there, again, there can be some overlap with GME, but this oftentimes has a, a, a little bit different CSF than GME. The necrotizing leukoencephalitis is similar 
to necrotizing meningoencephalitis, but as the name implies, it typically affects the white matter of the brain. This tends to be more in the more multifocal within the cerebrum and the brainstem versus enemy tends to be more in the forebrain. So these dogs are going to come in again with signs referable to the forebrain and the brainstem. So seizures, circling, vestibular signs. These are also progressive, but they sometimes will have more of a chronic course. I've seen some dogs come in with these that have been having seizures for six months. They have some mild neuro abnormalities. You think maybe they're an idiopathic um, epilepsy dog, but there's just something about them's not quite right. We image them and we, we find these necrotizing lesions in their brain. These dogs tend to have a similar CSF finding to, to GME. Here's two MRIs. Uh, the one on the left is a dog with enemy, so it, that one tends to affect more of the, the gray matter, but it also can affect the white matter, versus NLE tends to mostly be confined to the white matter. And this is just another example of the two different sequences of a dog with, with enemy, just showing how you can if you take away the CSF signal, you can, the inflammation will, will stand out a little bit more. And this is a dog with uh, necrotizing leukoencephalitis, and you can see pretty good on here on this T1 scan. It causes these basically cavitations in the brain. They get necrosis and malacia, and they actually get cavitary um, lesions within the brain. So some of the, I'd say, a little bit of the controversy that surrounds these diseases like GME and NME and NLE is, again, they're supposed to be histopath diagnoses. So a lot of the, the stuff that's coming out, the papers that are coming out, unless these dogs have either had necropsies or they've actually had biopsies, you can't call them, you know, you can't say they have GME or NME or NLE. So the term that's been coined to use in these dogs is meningoencephalitis of unknown etiology. And again, that was uh, during the discussion that I um, was a part of at ACIM. This term is not many people like it, because a lot of people think it sounds kind of like a cop-out. We're just saying, your dog has this. We have no idea what it is. But what this really means is we think your dog has an autoimmune type of encephalitis. We don't think this is infectious but we can't say specifically it's one of these recognized syndromes without a biopsy. So most of the, the papers that are coming out now that are including dogs that are still alive, are, they're going to talk about meningoencephalitis of known etiology, or MUE. Typically, the prognosis for these has been thought to be extremely poor. Um, again, a lot of the papers that came out on GME were looking at dogs that had had necropsies, so I think they're a little bit biased, but some of the, the papers that are still quoted and what owners will find on the internet and, and oftentimes quote to me is, I read about GME and it says the median survival time is eight days, and that's what was published for specifically for GME. Again, those, these are all necropsy dogs, so I think there's a lot of stuff that you have to take into account. And I think a lot of these dogs do a lot better than this. The, um, again, the ocular form has historically had a good survival period. For the necrotizing encephalitides, the prognosis is probably a little bit poorer, but not as poor as some of the papers suggest. Again, there is a paper looking at 36 dogs, and they said there is a median survival time of 11 days. So most of the time when we're talking about survival times, Again, we don't have histopath diagnosis, so that's where that term MUE comes in. So the, the prognosis is really variable, but on average, when I see these dogs and I tell people, you know, we see a, a pug or a Yorkie Maltese with these signs, on average, we're probably looking at a year and a half with appropriate treatment. I have some dogs that have been coming to me for over two years now, still getting treatment and doing well. So there's definitely dogs that, that do better but um, on average it is still, you know, it's not a long-term thing. You see this four-year-old dog come in, they're probably not going to live to be 10 years old. 
but if you can keep them happy for a year or two years, then I think most people would accept that rather than the alternative. The treatment um, is going to consist of some sort of immunosuppression. Steroids are going to be where we, where we start. And again, some diseases like our steroid responsive meningitis, um, our corticosteroid responsive tremor syndrome, that's all they need. But when we're talking about things like GME, NME, NLE, most of these dogs are going to do better if they're on more than one immunosuppressant. So we're going to go over some of the ones that we use. And most of the dogs that fit the signalment pretty well, we have a pretty confident that we have a pretty accurate diagnosis, we're just going to start immunosuppression. If it's a atypical breed, we have a lab that's showing these sort of symptoms, then I'm a little bit more concerned. Maybe this is infectious, probably going to do titers, trying to rule those things out, doing fungal titers, toxo, neospora. Um, and in the meantime, rather than immunosuppressing these guys, you may want to put them on a course of antibiotics. So things like doxycycline, the cover for tick-borne diseases, clindamycin or TMS for your protozoal diseases, these all penetrate the CNS. On the off chance we're worried about, a, um, we're actually worried about a bacterial infection, things like metronidazole is a good choice, a third generation cephalosporin, um, Batril, Batril and ampicillin um, will penetrate the blood-brain barrier if there's significant inflammation. If there's not, they don't, so they're not always the best choices when it comes to treating CNS diseases. So one of the, the drugs that I use most commonly in addition to steroids is going to be cytosine arabinoside. This is a chemo drug. It's when, again, at the forum, we, there was some polls that we did there in the discussion, and I'd say this is the most commonly used drug that most neurologists out there are using. And I'd say the reason why is this, dog tends, this drug tends to have very little side effects. I've only seen one dog that I had to actually pull off this drug because he had side effects from it. Um, I've never had a dog get severely myelosuppressed to where we had to treat it. Um, never really even seen any GI signs. It's just a nice drug in that most of the time you're not going to be seeing side effects. It, we know it penetrates the blood-brain barrier very well. It is given most of the time sub-Q. Um, there is some debate about that and whether or not we should be given it as a CRI IV. That was also a, a point of discussion. We don't know for these diseases what's the most appropriate route. So for most people, we're giving it sub-Q, which also is, is easier, on, uh, obviously, to administer. The downside to this is that it has to be given every three to four weeks. So you have to have these patients coming back every three to four weeks, which some people aren't willing to do. Um, the cost is not that expensive, but it is more than some of the other options we're going to talk about. But I'd say the dogs I've seen that have survived the longest oftentimes have been on this drug. And I think a lot of it is because they don't have side effects and the owners are willing to keep going versus sometimes with some of the other drugs we use, they're going to have more side effects and oftentimes it seems like some of the side effects of the meds is the reason they end up getting put to sleep and not necessarily from the disease itself. So the, the studies out there that have looked at this drug have shown favorable responses. Um, they have pretty small numbers of dogs, so it's hard to know how um, valid these are. There was one in 10 dogs, they had a median survival time of 531 days. Um, one in 11 dogs, that showed a probability of survival at two years of 58%. Cyclosporin is a, another option. I'd say I don't use this one a lot, but there are um, a lot of neurologists out there that like this drug and this will be their first choice um, besides prednisone. It, has pretty poor blood-brain barrier penetration, but it does concentrate in the vessels. And since GME is a, tends to be a disease that is located around the vessels, we think that's why it works as well as it does. There's been a, um, one study that's been published with 10 dogs that showed a median survival of 931 days, so that sounds pretty good. Um, again, I'm not sure this is necessarily better 
than any of the other options. But most of these studies, again, have such small numbers of dogs, it's hard to, to know if one drug's necessarily better than the other. Most dogs tolerate this pretty well, and you know, most people are gonna be able to, to get this drug. It's, you don't have any, take any major precautions, you're not dealing with a chemo drug. Azathioprine is another immunosuppressant that's starting to be used more commonly for things like GME. I'm starting to use it more in people that can't come in and do the cytosine injections. They, as long as they don't have you know, any significant um, concerns like liver problems, it's inexpensive. It does require some monitoring. They do have to do some blood work. And most dogs do well with it. I've had um, a few dogs I've had to take off of it because they develop a hepatopathy. So I'd say that's the biggest reason we end up having to discontinue this therapy. Some dogs have some GI problems on it, um, but for the most part, I'd say dogs do pretty well. And again, it's, it's inexpensive. Mycophenolate is another sort of newer immunosuppressant drug that's being used more commonly for this. This, um, this drug is nice because it also is, is fairly inexpensive. It's oral, the owners can give it. There's um, no myelosuppression associated with it, no liver problems, so this one's a good one to pick in dogs that have had some liver problems. They may be on azathioprine and they can't tolerate it, you have to switch, or they've had some myelosuppression. Um, so this is a good one to, to switch to. The biggest problem I've seen with this one is um, hemorrhagic diarrhea that usually subsides when you decrease the dose. And so after about a month, even if they're doing well on it, typically you decrease the dose just to avoid that, that from developing. There have been no studies, I will say, published to date with evaluating this in the use of GME or, or any of those diseases. Leflutamide is one that I personally haven't used for GME. The, um, I felt like more and more neurologists I talked to at the conference were starting to use this because they felt like the side effects were very minimal and they were having pretty good results. The cost of this, I believe, is, is fairly reasonable. I think it used to be more expensive and it, it's come down. So this is definitely another option that you have out there. Again, there's been one study and this was in uh, basically, I call it a case report of three dogs that were treated for what I'd call MUE. They didn't have histopath diagnoses, and they were all reported to survive for greater than 12 months. Lomustine is a, obviously a chemo agent that we use sometimes for this. I have treated some dogs with this, and they've done well, but this definitely has more potential for myelosuppression. I've had to take some dogs off of this because of this or even had them come into the hospital severely myelosuppressed and, and definitely sick. So this definitely requires fairly frequent monitoring and has potential for, for side effects. This can sometimes be a, a decent choice in a dog that where it's not a clear-cut diagnosis, there's a chance that they do have a a brain tumor, it's not 100%, is this inflammatory, is this a tumor? This may be a drug that you might reach for in those situations. Procarbazine is one of the drugs that has been used, I'd say a little bit more commonly for GME. Um, again, it's also a chemo agent, so there's all the precautions that come, uh, come along with that. Uh, myelosuppression is possible. We know it crosses the blood-brain barrier well, though, so this is another choice. So partly by just going over all these drugs, I just want you to be aware, there's a lot of options when it comes to, to treating these diseases. Usually what I do is once we make a diagnosis, start talking to the owners about, you know, these are our options. Oftentimes I'll, you know, talk about cytosine most because that's what I feel most comfortable with. I know dogs do well with that. If they can't do that though, then one of these oral drugs is usually going to be able to work. Sometimes it's a matter of finding the pill size that works best for the dog, cost of the medication, how often they're able to come do monitoring, do they have any other medical problems, like I said, like liver disease or any past history with any sort of myelosuppression that may factor into what you choose.
Radiation therapy has been reported as well to be used for the focal forms of GME where they have one mass-like lesion in the brain. The, the only study out there I'm aware of looked at six dogs that had a, I'd say a reasonable survival time of 404 days. This is obviously not something that's commonly used, but it is something that's reported out there. And we have one, one slide on cats. We don't see, overall, I don't see a lot of cats in general, and I'd say I see even less cats with inflammatory disease. They can get some of these sterile inflammatory diseases like dogs. It's much less common. If I see a cat come in and they're showing multifocal intracranial signs, we're usually trying to rule out infectious things first, things like cryptococcus. Even in indoor-only cats, it's been shown to be just as common as it is in the outside, um, inside cats. So that's certainly a consideration. FIP tends to cause central vestibular signs. So cats are a little bit different, but they, they can have some of these non-infectious inflammatory diseases as well. It's just not nearly as common.